We're all familiar with Jesus' words in Matthew's Gospel when he said, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren, you did it to me. On today's show, Bishop Caggiano is talking about the Christian duty that each one of us has to help one another. This is an important calling for all of us, and it's coming up on Let Me Be Frank, right here on your radio at 13.50 a.m. or on your phone through the Veritas mobile app. If you don't have the app yet, you can grab it at the Apple App Store, the Google Play Store, or at VeritasCatholic.com. Let Me Be Frank is brought to you by a grant from Foundations in Faith. Foundations in Faith embraces innovative approaches to funding pastoral care programs in the Diocese of Bridgeport. Resources focus on energizing lifelong faith formation and discipleship and fostering a commitment to justice and accompaniment with our most vulnerable. From seminarians to retired priests, from baptism to last rites, from suburbs to inner cities, the reach is broad, the impact is meaningful. For more information, visit foundationsinfaith.org. All right, so this is Let Me Be Frank on the Veritas Catholic Network. I am Steve Lee, and it is my pleasure, as always, to introduce Bishop Frank Caggiano. Steve, it's good to see you again, my friend. We we pre-taped a few of these shows. It's been a while since we've been together, so it's good to see you. Yeah, you know, I think we only went a week without seeing each other. But Is that right? Yeah. It feels like longer than that. Well, it just... Well, that's... Yeah. I guess you missed me. (laughs) I did. I did. And our conversations. Uh, how is the summer, by the way? Excellency, the summer is going great. Um, Good. You know, uh, as we mentioned, as I talked to you about, you know, I got to go away with my family for one week. It was our first vacation in two years. Um, I took my wife and I took uh, our two younger kids to the American Museum of Natural History one day, um, two weekends ago. And that was fantastic. So it just feels like we're slowly getting back to normal. Getting into the swing of things. Yes. Yeah. That may, yes. Yes. I had the family up to the former Episcopal residence in Trumbull. Yes. And I was exhausted. I was exhausted. <laughs> because, you know, my little great niece is six years old. My great nephew is four years old. And I said to myself, where did they get all this energy from? Oh, <laughs> gosh. Really? <laughs> Did you? You said you were going to get a bouncy house. Did you get one? Yes. Yeah, so they love the bouncy house. But it rains most of those days. Uh, you know, the weather has not been that great. Right? It's been, We've got yeah. The, people out west are just, it's awful in the west. Yeah. The yep. heat is just, it's, 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 it's life-threatening. And we have had, I mean, I don't think we've had a very warm or hot summer, per se, but a wet one we've had. Yeah. Yeah. So... Anyway, so they bounced in the house, not in the bouncy house, but in the house. <laughs> <laughs> all I bet but you I that love, was... I love when they're there. I love it, though. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Yeah, I'm sure. And the way you talk about them, I mean, I'm sure you had a, oh, yeah. a great, great time. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, so we, today we are talking about... Helping one another. So we asked our listeners, Excellency, to send mm-hmm. in topics for discussion. And so here mm-hmm. we go. This is the first one of... Uh, that we've received in an email. And mm-hmm. um, yeah, it's it's basically about our Christian duty to help our neighbor. Right, right, right. You know, it's, it's interesting. Uh, the obligation to help one another, one could argue, is even in the natural order, that people, sh- normally speaking, are disposed to react when a person is in need before them and to react in a favorable way. One could say our DNA, if it's properly formed, you know, your life probably would naturally open a person to do that. But we're talking about the Christian context, right? So there's something fundamentally different here because you are not going to just help those you like or help those who can respond Really, the mandate is to help everyone. Because the parable of the Good Samaritan, the point of it is that my neighbor could be a Samaritan. That is, could be someone 
who is unexpected, outside the law, considered unclean. So the obligation of the Christian is to help everyone to the extent that that is possible. So now the question is, where does it arise? So the verb, right, the infinitive to help has a predecessor, which is to love. And helping is one manifestation of the obligation to love our neighbor. You can help your neighbor, right? You can accompany your neighbor. You can also correct your neighbor. They are all functions of loving your neighbor. And if you look at it that way, then we have to remember why we help our neighbor. We help our neighbor for two reasons in the Christian faith. First is because God loves that person. And we are obligated to love what God loves. God loves every human being unconditionally. Therefore, we, if we wish to honor God, will love our neighbor and help our neighbor precisely because God loves them. That's number one. And number two, an effective way, we've talked about this before, to love God is precisely through loving our neighbor because to love God, to will his good, there is nothing we can will for him. But his spirit dwells in every person, particularly the baptized, in which case you honor God by loving and helping that person. So for those two principal reasons, this is a mandate. This is not optional. It's not up for discussion, whether I like or not. It doesn't work that way. It's a package deal. So, having said that, one could say, well, sounds idealistic. I'm going to go for it. How do I do this? And we kind of live in the age of the extraordinary, the fantastic, the surreal, the attention grabber, the headline event, all this stuff. There may be occasions when you'll have a spectacular moment of helping someone in need. But generally speaking, it's done in the ordinariness of life. And again, we do it in two ways. You're called to help the neighbor you know and to help the neighbor you may not know. And they're not done the same way. So the help a neighbor you do not know can be through charity, through service, through volunteer hours. Because many of the people who will come forward or directly benefit, you may never know who they are. And then there are the neighbors you do know where the obligation to help them takes on a much more tangible form. And it seems to me and maybe this is self-revelatory in my own way, but to help the neighbor you do not know can actually be easier than helping the neighbor you do know. Right? You're shaking your head. So yeah, I think I, yeah. <laughs> right. Because the neighbor you do know, you easily excuse yourself because you know more of the circumstances. Oh, her son will call, right? Or her daughter will go visit. Or my wife will take care of it. Or I'll send my son to do it. But the obligation is mine to do. So you write a check in charity, generously, to feed the poor. But my neighbor next door doesn't have a meal. I'm not writing a check to anybody. I'm going to bring a meal. Right? And that's where you have the moments of profound grace and conversion. Profound. Also profound moments of rejection, too. When a person says, I don't want your food, I don't want you, get out. Right? That's part of the brokenness of life. But some of the most beautiful moments I've ever experienced in my life were in those moments where a person was helped personally. Many times a parishioner when I was pastor. That it just, it was just beautiful. Because they, the personal touch help make the love, the offer of love, more tangible and real. That's why the Lord did everything he did the way he did, right, with personal contact. That's how you not just help the person physically, materially, but you help them spiritually. You become an agent of healing, right? So that's the larger context. The why, in my mind, is very clear for a believer, for all those reasons. Now, 
we can talk about the traditional corporal works of mercy and the spiritual works of mercy, which are kind of like, I call them the cheat sheet of how well you're doing. <laughs> okay. So if you go down the list and say, no, 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 then you're, you're on the wrong track. <laughs> um, both. All right. So now, you know, I'm going to ask you this question. You probably studied already. All right. Give me the corporal works of mercy. Yeah. So uh, we have seven of each. Um, yep. Uh, feed the hungry. Mm -hmm. um, give drink to the thirsty. Mm -hmm. um, give shelter to the homeless. Mm -hmm. um, clothing to the naked. Mm -hmm. um, visit You're the imprisoned. Great. You're doing great. Five visit out of seven. The sick. You're six out of seven. It's a B plus. Oh, I can't remember the last one. Oh, come on. Let B oh, them bury the dead. Yes, A plus. <laughs> <laughs> right. And the corporal works of mercy have all to do with the physical needs of people. So it's making love respond in a tangible way. Of all of those seven, in my own experience, number five and seven, that is visiting the sick and burying the dead, have been the most profound moments of grace for me. You know, I remember when I was pastor of St. Dominic's, one of my parishioners was paralyzed from the neck down. And I visited her on a regular basis. And when I look back, it was my attempt uh, to bring Holy Communion and just to bring solace and company. And I'm not ashamed to admit she ministered to me more than I ministered to her. She gave me much more than I ever gave to her. And she may not know that. And that's how the corporal works of mercy work. Because if you're really giving them as an act of love, you're giving it in such a way that the person who is being loved has the freedom to love you back. And that levels the playing field between this illusion that they don't have what we have. Well, they have what we need many times. And that's the beauty of community, which is the fundamental building block of Christian faith, that we are all members of one body. And burying the dead... I mean, physically digging the hole to bury a person is not quite what's meant there. Although in its day, that's exactly what it meant, hmm. right? Um, but in our age, it really is in many ways, I think <coughs> the bereavement ministry is preparing a person to die spiritually and physically, taking care of them you know, Steve, we all know couples, spouses who took care of other spouses up to their dying moment, physically yep. took care of them. Yep. Right? I mean, that is, that's what we're talking about. But you also prepare them spiritually. And in turn, the family who's left behind also right, needs to be cared for. So in my mind, all of that's wrapped up in this burying the dead. And then we have the spiritual works of mercy which attend to the needs of the spirit. Or, you know, I'm going to ask you. Oh, boy. <laughs> okay, let me see. These are, I, to me, these are more difficult to remember because the yes, corporal... They are. Yeah. Yes, so, yes um, they are. So definitely pray for the living and the dead. Yep. Um, instruct the ignorant. No, uh, let's stop there for a second. That okay. is kind of harsh the way it's put, but that's exactly what, this, what it is. But what does that actually mean? It's, so you know, is you, are you obligated to teach me math if I'm ignorant of math? Because <laughs> you're going to have a long road ahead of you. <laughs> what? Right. Go ahead, Excellency. What, so what does that mean? It's to teach the faith. Right. That's the really purpose here. It's to teach a person of the living God and his dwelling in our midst. Right. And his enduring presence in the church. So just so people understand, it's really it's we're talking about the faith, but that's okay. exactly how it's called. 
to, to instruct the ignorant. Good. So you okay. got two out of five. Okay. One more you pass. <laughs> uh, forgive, uh, forgive those who, who wrong you um, and bear wrongs patiently, although I can't remember if those are the same one or if they're nope. two different. They're two different no, ones. No, they're separate. There's two different ones. All right, let's uh, stop at that one now. Okay. Okay. This is a let me be frank moment. <laughs> to bear wrongs patiently for me is very difficult. Because a part of my personality wants to go fix it, right? That may not always be pretty, but to, to, a part of my personality says, just forget it ever happened, kind of like, all right, so we're done, let's move on. But to bear a wrong patiently is to allow it to sit there, right? And in a sense, instruct us. Because when we are corrected, it's very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. When we're wronged, it's very uncomfortable. And most of the time, our reaction is to avoid dealing with that. But in fact, there's a, there are many lessons to be learned here. So not only do you in the end, all right, put up with the person, kind of be sympathetic or compassionate with the person who did the wrong, hopefully to, to, to come to realize that. But if, if a person has wronged you, many times they're giving you a gift because it gives you insight into your own life, into your spiritual life. And how you react is instructive too. So you put up with the wrongs because hopefully one day you'll forgive the person if, you, if he allows you or she allows you that opportunity to forgive them for the wrong. But I... I need to work on this in my own life to just admit the wrong, just let it sit there. And like, so what does this say about me and how do I need to change kind of thing? Right. So there's a benefit even personally from that. Okay. Yeah. So we got instruct the ignorant, bear wrongs patiently, forgive offenses willingly, pray for the living and the dead. We got three more. So I think I'm only going to get one more. I can only think of comfort the sorrowful. Yeah. Right, which goes hands in hands with what I said before, the corporal work of mystery, burying the dead. Yes. Right. Yep. Now, one, as a parent, you must do often. Cor with correct. With your children. Admonish correct the, sinner. the sinner. Yes. Right. Okay. Admonish the sinner. How would you do that? How do you admonish a sinner? Uh, I feel like it goes hand in hand again with uh, instructing the ignorant. And with, mm -hmm. and with bearing wrongs patiently. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I know with my, with my kids, the way I present things can make a world of difference. Amen. 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 That's the difference in what you talked before about preaching and effectively preaching. It's interesting. It doesn't say correct the sinner it says admonish the sinner uh, that's an excellent insight sometimes it is how we say things that can actually either help or hinder a person who has wronged or sinned to come to realize that sin i think the very act of admonishing calls to mind like um, reprimanding someone. But admonishing someone is almost warning a sinner. So there's a nuance there that I think we need to think about. You're warning someone not to sin again. How do you do that effectively is the key, right? Makes all the difference in the world. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, if, and, and as you said many mm -hmm. times, you can't do that if you don't first have a relationship with that person. Without a doubt. And I think that's where parents have just an absolutely irreplaceable effect on their children. Because if I saw your son and admonished him, he would see it, I don't know exactly how I would see it, but he would see it as a religious figure, person of authority. But for, a, for his father or mother to do it, it's different. 
Yeah. Like I remember, I, I remember when my mother used to admonish me when I used to do stuff wrong, which was very rare. <laughs> but, but when it happens, okay, uh, I felt awful. Oh my gosh. Right? Because it's the sense of, you know, I let my mother down and oh, it just, and oh no. And then she would just have that look. It was like, it was like, ugh. So in many ways, to learn to admonish someone correctly de is dependent on the circumstances, on the relationship you have. But it's extremely important. Yeah. And the last one is to counsel the doubtful. Which goes hand in hand with in instructing the ignorant. You, you kind of see like these kind of are painted as sides of a, let's say, a diamond. Hmm. In the end, they all in some way, shape or form are touching each other. We're looking at the full spiritual life of a person and the full corporeal physical life of a person to meet both because we are body and soul yes. spirit mhm mm mhm mm yeah so um one of the questions that came in uh from this listener um on this topic was uh I, i'll just read it um are there repercussions for selfishness and greed or for those who drive luxury automobiles while others starve or battle illness? Ooh, it's an interesting question. Um, well, are there consequences to greed and selfishness? Without a doubt. Without a doubt. Because in the end, um, by your own self-choice, you're cutting yourself off from the font of life that grace is by becoming self-absorbed or at worst, right, self-possessed in the, in the wrong sense, right? Um, or selfish is the better word. Because in the end, we are made in the image and likeness of God and God is love that is pure gift. So we're living in a way totally detrimental, totally opposed to the very constitution we're given by the creator. You know, the classic example is Ebenezer Scrooge. Classic example of what in the end did he have? Everything materially and nothing. He was dead, yeah. even though he was breathing. In extreme, but sometimes the extreme tells, tells the story better than any nuanced speech. Yeah. And I often think about that. But... Are there those who drive luxury automobiles while others starve or battle illness? Now, this is a very complicated question. Because I have learned that we, it is very unhealthy to judge from the outside. Because if a person drives a luxury car, whatever it may be, I have no idea but what's considered luxury nowadays. But... That person who may have significant means may have given a disproportionate amount of money to aid those who are poor or hungry or naked or imprisoned or whatever. Yes. Than I do with far less money because proportionately I may be driving uh, something that's smaller but not as equally generous. Right. So if that's the schema, who's actually the one who may be more selfish? I think there is an economic disparity in the United States. And there is movement afoot to try to correct it. I'm not an economist. I'm not a politician. Thank God. But it seems to me that, at least in Fairfield County, the middle class is under more and more duress. Nor are there many positions that actually create that sense of tear. 
So in some way, shape, or form, I think that economic disparity has to be addressed as a society. And I'm open to suggestions as to how people think we should do that. I don't think anyone has the full answer quite yet. So you will see more luxury cars. But one should not jump to the conclusion that therefore these individuals are selfishly holding on to their money because they may not be. They may actually be proportionally far more generous. Yeah. It's really what you do with that, that which God gave you that makes all the difference. What have you done with it? Yes. And yeah. how generous are you proportionally? That is the real question here. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we're all we're all called to it. No matter what we're driving, what we have in our bank accounts, we're all right. called to help to do, the means that remember, we can. Right? Do you remember the parable that Jesus spoke of, where the landowner forgave the debt of the of the servant, but then yes. the servant did not forget the debt? Okay, so now that's really what we're talking about. A wealthy man did forgive, but the one who was not wealthy refused to forgive. Yeah. So in that story, who's the greatest sinner? Of course, yeah. the person with less money, not more. <laughs> yeah, it's the disposition of the heart, as you're saying. Exactly, exactly. Right. So let me ask you this, though, Steve. The corporal works of mercy, spiritual works of mercy. Any order to them? Like if someone said to you, are any more important than the others? What would you say? It seems to me that... Uh, uh, no, because we are, like, as you said, we're body and soul. And so both, uh, mm -hmm. you can't, you can't say, well, I'm just doing the spiritual stuff. I'm not doing the, the, uh, the corporal right. stuff or vice versa. Is, right. is that right? Yeah, I would agree. I would think the missionaries taught us that because the missionaries would attend to the human needs of the people they encountered before they actually started to preach the gospel because you can't preach the gospel and effectively believe it's going to be heard with an empty stomach. Yeah, right. Right? So, On the other hand, I would say this. I think in a world where a lot of people have their corporal needs met, it's the spiritual works of mercy that have to be emphasized because yes. they, their bellies are full, but their spirits are wanting. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. So on the other side of the break, Excellency, we'll talk about four men who really put these into practice. Um, but we do need to take a quick break. This is Let Me Be Frank with Bishop Frank Caggiano on the Veritas Catholic Network. We will be right back. Catholic Radio works, and now we have it here in Connecticut and New York. It's been seen around the country that there's no better tool for evangelization. Where there's Catholic Radio, the folks who listen deepen their faith. Families are strengthened, parishes and communities flourish. So, let people know you're listening to Veritas, tell your friends to tune in, and let's make an impact here for Jesus and His Church. This is Steve Lee for Veritas Catholic Network. All right, welcome back to Let Me Be Frank on the Veritas Catholic Network. Uh, Excellency, since we've been talking about helping others, loving others, this is a great opportunity to talk about um, some modern-day saints, or, or at least these four men are on their way to sainthood, uh, hopefully. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. last month at the USCCB, the bishops overwhelmingly voted to um, open the causes of canonization for two of these heroic men. And so let's start with one of them. Um, it's Servant of God, uh, Joseph Verbis Lafleur. Mm -hmm. Well, first, before I, let me just say this. Yes. I thank you for suggesting this topic because I knew very little. I knew just the perfunctory material on these four men. And like I try to do for homework when we do these podcasts, read a bit more about their lives. Fascinating testimonials of courage, mercy, priestly witness. Three of the four are priests. One was a Benedictine monk eventually, right? Yes. And all in our time. These yes. are chaplains in World War II, in Korea, and Vietnam. Yeah. Right? So these, are great, these men are great role models for ourselves and our young people, our young adults, right? When we talk about duty and honor and principle, and it's like God first, and then of course country as well, 
No, it was it was it was a delight to really learn about this. So I have learned a lot in doing this too. So okay. I appreciate that. For Joseph Lafleur, basically, he died in uh, September of 1944. He was a Roman Catholic priest, of course, of the military ordinariate. So the archdiocese of the military ordinariate, military services, has these candidates within its ranks among its chaplains. Will please God one day be these? These, um, these saints. Yeah. And he died in the sinking of a ship that, if my memory serves me correctly, was sunk by the United States, right? Because the military did not know that there were these prisoners of war on the ship. So it was mixed intelligence. But he was born in Louisiana, poor family, his father abandoned his family. He was one of seven children. He became, so imagine, all right, how difficult it was being raised there. He became a chaplain in the Army Air Corps, right? He refused to be evacuated from his post in the Philippines, right? He stayed behind, mm -hmm. right, with the soldiers under his care. Mm -hmm. So it was that blending of duty to God and country he, his men were his parish, and he stayed by them. He was captured by the Japanese, and he served the prisoners of war to the best of his ability. Yeah. Right? He gave them food, even his own food, gave them comfort, tried as best he could to advocate for him, for them. Um, just, it's just absolutely remarkable. He saved some wounded men in the line of fire. He, in fact, there was three men who jumped overboard during an attack. He saved their lives, brought them into lifeboats. That prevented him from being evacuated to Australia. Right, So in the end, this man, beaten under captivity, mocked, and when he started to, ref when he started to share his food, was starved. Mm -hmm. um, just a tremendous testimonial. Yeah. It's in right? conditions like those that you, you know, imagine in the Japanese POW camp, where... It's oh. so natural to just start thinking about your own survival and yourself. Mm -hmm. And he did not. Yeah. No, not at all. Not at all. And again, when, when the submarine torpedoed the ship, and again, it was accidental, and there were 750 U.S. military personnel on the ship, and I believe almost all of them died, perished. Um, you could imagine his last moments was with the men that he was there to serve. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's heroic, right? We talk about heroes. All four of these men are heroes. Without yeah. a doubt. Yeah. Without a doubt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tell us about um, a Servant of God, Brother Marinus LaRue. Oh, wait, let me, let me spell the name of, uh, of uh, Father LaFleur for folks if they want to look him up. It's it's mm -hmm. his father Joseph Lafleur, uh, L A F L E U R. So he's French, French name. Mm -hmm. um, and here's and Louisiana. Now, yes, that's right. Yep, Louisiana. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and then we we've got servant of God, brother Marinus Larue. All right. So now, Marinus is his religious name, but his Christian christening name was Leonard LaRue. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things we have to remember is this man was not a priest. He was a layman. He was the captain of a ship, the Meredith Victory. He was in the United States Merchant Marine, and he was a cargo freighter. That was a cargo, so he was the captain of a cargo freighter. And this is what blew my mind away. He was involved in the single 
largest humanitarian rescue operation by a single ship in recorded history. 14,000 people during the Korean War. Okay, so what's the story? All right, so he is basically loading and unloading ship, right, as part of this war effort. He arrives in this port. It's besieged in Northeast Korea. 100,000 Korean refugees had gathered hoping to be evacuated under United Nations command because basically North Korea is collapsing. And North Korea collapses because the Chinese intervened. In mm -hmm. fact, the Americans had driven the North Korean soldiers to 50 miles of the Chinese border. Anyway, there were 14,000 people who remained. And they were trapped. So what he does is, um, in, a, in an act that, I mean, would have, if he had not died and captured him, I mean, it would have probably court-martialed him, but he took his boat, and he threw all the cargo off, all of it, guns, ammunition, cargo, everything. And he loaded 40,000 people on this boat, as many as he could. And they were only hours away from the Chinese and the North Korean communist forces overrunning the port ship. And he sailed. Now, mind you, mines all over, no mine detection. There is no interpreter. There's no doctor, there's no lighting, there's no heat, there's no sanitation facilities to speak of. And on Christmas Eve, right, I think it was three days later, he actually entered port and these people were saved. It's amazing. Right. And he then, after the war, he was not captured, right? He was not captured. He discerned a religious vocation, became a Benedictine, for what I remember. And that's how he got the name Brother Marinus. Well, of course, Marinus, he was on the ocean. <laughs> yep. Uh, and he committed his days to the Benedictine rule, which is work and prayer. Yeah. Right? So once again, a remarkable decision that was made not... And, and, and it, 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 the decision exemplified a life. Okay, to do what he did in that split moment was motivated by the profound faith he had. And again, it's a testimony. If you want to see it almost as a parable, we live in a world that chooses the material, that chooses the comfort, that chooses self-preservation that chooses to be in right, as we say in the scriptures, in right odor with people. But he was none of that. He was none of that. Again, a remarkable testimony. Yeah. I was struck by, as you said, um, three of these men are priests, but uh, Brother Marinus never became a priest. Instead, no. in his humility, he spent his life washing dishes and working in the gift shop there at the... Uh, the Benedictine right. Abbey. Right. And apparently in his 50 years in the Abbey, he never once really talked about his exploits where he saved yeah. 14,000 Koreans. Yeah, imagine. Really, it's imagine. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. As the next two are, it's just e equally so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... <clears throat> I think this next guy is going to probably be out of the four. If somebody knows some something about um, the four men we're talking about, they'll probably know about this gentleman. And back on Memorial Day, Excellency, our show, The Frontline with Joe and Joe, Joe and Joe, um, they interviewed two men about Father Vincent Capadano. One of them was Captain George Phillips, who served alongside Father Capadano in the Vietnam War. And the other one mm -hmm. was a gentleman who um, runs the Father Capitano Guild. But mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A, again, another, another amazing heroic man, right, Excellency? Without a doubt. You know, I was familiar with the name Capitano since I was a kid because um, when I would make my forays into Staten Island, 
there is Father Capadano Drive, which is right past the Verrazano Bridge. And I always wondered to myself, who is this Father Capadano? You know, I thought maybe he was in the monastery up there in, in, or in Staten Island or at the retreat house. And it's only in recent times that I come to appreciate the history, right? And the man, I mean, he, he died in the Vietnam War, right? He's part of the yes. Marine Corps, yep. 1967. Yeah. He was a priest and he was also a Mary Nola. And he won the Medal of Honor and he is servant of God, as you say. The one thing that endeared me immediately when I did research on Capadano is that he was one of 10 children of an Italian-American family. <laughs> From New York. <laughs> right there. You're nine-tenths of way to sainthood. <laughs> Are you kidding? <laughs> and he worked as an insurance clerk for a while, right? Then oh, he wow, into, I didn't know that. Yeah. And he went into the Marino Missionary Seminary in Ozanin. And ordained a priest by the one and only Cardinal Spellman. Yeah. So he went to Taiwan as a missionary for a while. He served in Hong Kong. Then he volunteered as a military chaplain. And that's where he began his military service in Vietnam. Yeah. And another interesting fact about Capadano is in his, in his work in the military, he befriended a lieutenant by the name of Frederick W. Smith, who after his military service was over, founded Federal Express. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. Amazing. The sort of people you meet <laughs> in battle. <laughs> anyway, just remarkable stories. You may know some from the other, from the stories that you already went through. Um, but involved in battle, he... He went out in the line of fire to care for the wounded and the dying Marines, giving them last rites. I mean, he literally defied the fire. Yeah. And I believe that is how he died, right? Yes. That he was in the early evening one night, he, was, he went to, to, there was a seriously wounded Navy corp, corpsman and two wounded Marines just a few yards from where he was, and in his attempt to reach them, he was killed. Yeah. So he was martyred. If we talk about the corporal works at Mercy, right? He was martyred in that very act of doing that. Yeah. He wasn't your mm -hmm. typical chaplain, because chaplains, I guess, from what I read, had their place. Stay, at, stay out of the line of fire, stay in the back, Father, where you can't get hurt. He was there knee deep in the mud with the, with the guys. Oh yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. And, and again, it's more recent. Mm -hmm. Cause we talk about the great generation and the, the, what happened in World War II, but we're talking in the sixties. So we're only talking 50 years ago, less than that. In a time when you looked at the country in the United States, which I do remember, right? I was eight, nine, ten years old protests and all this stuff and Woodstock and all this stuff going on. And yet in the trenches, you see this just heroic, valiant, Christian self-sacrifice for the spiritual and physical goods, yeah. right? Good of the people he was entrusted to it really is remarkable. Yeah. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That operation where Father Capadano died was called Operation Swift. So if you're listening and you want to Google it, it's an, it's an incredible battle story. And Father acted with complete disregard for his own personal safety and just this incredible love for the fellow men on the battlefield. Um, I saw, Excellency, that many of the men who served with him after he died then went on to convert to the Catholic faith. Oh, yeah, I could imagine. But yeah, without a doubt. <laughs> yeah, without a doubt. Well, because when you, you encounter authenticity, it's compelling. Right? Yes. Yep. Yeah, it's compelling. Yeah. Yeah, it's just, um, you know, in my more wistful moments, I wonder to myself, are we ever going to learn the lesson, though? This, could we ever l imagine a time when there would not be this violence and hatred in the world so that a person like a father Capadano could live his heroic virtue 
yeah. to a ripe old age. Yeah. Doesn't I, seem we're anywhere near that. Yeah, I know. It's but it's in times like these, as you've said before, where God does raise up saints. It's when it's dark, that's when God raises the saints up. Um Exactly. I, I saw this I read this story, Excellency, that kinda it reminded me of you and of another great um Italian Catholic um Mother Angelica because of his sense of humor. And so I guess one day at lunch, Father Capadano was there with the men at one of the tables and uh, another lieutenant rushed into the mess tent and he runs up to the table and he used an expletive, which I won't use, but this, this guy runs up and says, what kind of blah, blah, blah soup do we have today? And uh, the men at the table knew Father was there with them. So they kind of just sat up straight and they didn't say anything, but they all looked at Father Capadano for his reaction and Father, without missing a beat, looks around and says, well, if that's the kind of soup he wants, let him have it. <laughs> <laughs> Mother so, Angelica was Italian? I didn't know yeah, that. Yeah, Rita Rizzo. <laughs> you know, maybe I did know that and it didn't click until you just said it now. <laughs> yeah, she's, she's uh, incredible. So um, wow. maybe we'll talk okay. about her on another show. Mm-hmm. And we have one last one. Yes. Yes. So this guy is um, – uh, it's funny because a couple of years ago, my family and I went to Auriesville, New York to see the Shrine of the North American Martyrs. And mm-hmm. at the gift shop, you know, our kids were each getting something. And one of my boys picked up this little figure of servant of God, Father Emil Capon, who we knew nothing about. But he mm-hmm. liked the thing, so he got it. And mm-hmm. And here's another – great man you know from the military go ahead excellency mm-hmm. well he was also a chaplain in the military he served world war ii and korea and saw fighting in both and to fast forward to the end of his life all right he was captured and died a prisoner of war in a war camp and underwent tremendous personal suffering, including frozen feet, literally frozen feet, blood clots, diarrhea. Again, he helping those who were with him. It's just uh, again, remarkable. From Kansas, <laughs> one from Louisiana, one from Kansas. You know, the midsection of the country is doing great. Father <laughs> Capadano, I mean, thank God for we're from the East. <laughs> we have some representation here. <laughs> It was like the heartland of America. You yeah. know, I have this, this kind of, you know, it's kind of almost romanticizing in my mind, but, you know, living off the land, that there's something about that that keeps you focused, you know, real in the end. Not all this ethereal stuff that we get all wrapped up with in our lives. Anyway, so... Um, so, as I said, he grew up in Kansas. He went to Kendrick Theological Seminary in St. Louis. I was there a few years ago. I gave the retreat to the seminarians. Oh, wow. So to consider for the seminarians that one of their former uh, colleagues will be ranked among the saints. It's tremendous. That's cool. Tremendous inspiration to all those men. And he's from the Diocese of Wichita, Kansas. Right? So, I mean... Some of this sounds familiar in so much as, you know, he was out in battle, saved people's lives. Right? He braved to, to save a, a man when there was no one, nothing even to carry the man with small arms fire, machine gun fire. He went out because, again, that man was in his care. Yeah. He would make makeshift altars. He would celebrate mass on the hood of his car, his little Jeep. To the soldiers in the right, yeah, and you know um, he was taken captive right, in the Korean War, and he had to march eighty-seven miles to the camp. He had pneumonia, as I mentioned, he had the blood clots on one of his legs, and he eventually just died. I mean, his body gave out. There was only so much suffering he could take. 
And I think, he, again, he is, you know, I have these images, like if you, we were to film the story of his life, the sanctity came out, not just in the extraordinary moments of, you know, braving gunfire, but just like you described Father Capodanno, with your, with your soldiers, with your fellow soldiers, the camaraderie, the laughing, the moments of quiet and advice, the anxieties the men had, the tears, the wives and children left behind, the quiet hours of the night, to be able to be there. That's the, that's the perseverance. Yeah. That's the sanctity of a life in service to others. It's all those ordinary moments right, that affected the lives of thousands of people. Yeah, it's, it's quite, it's quite, a, it's quite amazing. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. All four men, really tangibly, concretely, you know, doing those corporal and spiritual works of mercy, as you said. And three yeah. of them giving their lives. Right? No greater love has right. man than this. Well, you know, I had a note in the, in the, the side column of, of the material I put together that at the height of the, the maltreatment in the war camp, in the POW camp. It was not uncommon that two, th two dozen prisoners of war would die every day. Wow. Every day. So imagine just, if you had the ability, the funeral rites, how psychologically and physically exhausting that would be. Yeah. Apart from everything else, and to keep the the men's morale up, yeah. that's that earns the title father. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Excellency, let's take one more break. Um, mm -hmm. We'll be back with a listener question. This is "Let Me Be Frank" with Bishop Frank Caggiano on the Veritas Catholic Network. Why do we need Catholic radio? Because not everybody is sitting in front of a computer or watching their television set at home. How about when driving to work? How about while at work at your desk? Catholic Radio is there for you. I may be a Catholic priest, but I'm still a student of the faith. And Catholic Radio helps supply good material, whether it be a question and answer format show, whether it be a show itself on doctrine or theology. I myself, as a priest, am always learning. Welcome back to Let Me Be Frank with Bishop Frank Caggiano. Excellency. All right, so here's an interesting question this week came in, and it's, it asks, uh, Bishop Frank, what is your favorite feast day and mass to celebrate and why? Hands down, Holy Thursday, Mass of the Lord's Supper. Hands down. When I was a young boy, it was the one liturgical event that fascinated me more than any other, more than Christmas, more than Easter. As I grew older, I became a seminarian. Of course, it's the day of the institution of the priesthood. Yes. But two events I find extremely moving. Even now, in my early old age, okay? Number one is the washing of the feet. Because we've talked about loving others. That's the great symbol. Attending the corporal doing the work of slave and spiritual, the humility that the savior offered to his apostles. And the second, believe it or not, was the hours of, re of, uh, of the repose of the blessed sacrament. I can still remember, I would, I would sit in church, oh, at least, two hours, at least, with mom. His mom would live in church, so there's not a problem. If I want to stay, it was fine. She'd just keep praying. She was very happy. <laughs> uh, because I can't even begin to tell you, even to this day, now a celebrant, when the lights are turned out, turned off, and the light is only at the repository, and the altar is stripped, it just, in my mind, evokes the, the Lord being stripped 
it's the we're entering into what seems to be the apparent victory of evil, which it's not. Right. Right. The you know, John says, and it was night. All of that just conjures up in my mind a, a level of um, intimacy with the Lord that it just does not happen in the exact same way in any other liturgy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, beautiful. And you know what I used to think before before we wrap this part up? When I was younger, as a pastor, I stayed until reparation, uh, between the reposition, the hours were over. But the thought that crossed my mind is, so the, everything is stripped. So are you going to leave too? Right? Because that was the night that the apostles just walked away. So that stripping was more than just taking away the niceties. It's like, where are you going now? Oh, I can still, I can still feel it. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. If you have a question for Bishop Frank, send it in to us on social media, or you can email questions at veritascatholic.com. Bishop Frank Caggiano is on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and so is Veritas Catholic Network. We would also like to thank Foundations in Faith. A grant from the St. Therese Fund for Evangelization makes it possible for us to bring Let Me Be Frank to you. Foundations in Faith is committed to supporting and transforming pastoral ministries in the Diocese of Bridgeport, and you can learn more about their outstanding work at foundationsinfaith.org. Excellency, would you please give us your blessing? Absolutely. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, in our, this time of great challenge, we ask that your Spirit continue to bless and guide us in the work we have before us. Help us to follow the example of the venerables and servants of God whom we have discussed this day. May we rise to the same heroism and valor, selflessness and charity, conviction of mind and heart to be your faithful witnesses in the world. And may your Holy Spirit guide and bless us in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Steve, it was great talking with you. I'll see you next week then, my Thanks, friend. Thanks, Excellency. All the best. Bye.